Hello everyone and welcome to Victoria's Cantina. Today's review is of Rogue One, a Star Wars story. This will be a spoiler review, so if you haven't yet seen Rogue One, do yourself a favor and go watch it before listening to this. Are you still there? Okay, hopefully you've seen Rogue One. I watched Rogue One on opening day. I left the theater quite happy even though I did have a few issues with it. But I let it gestate for a few days and held off on doing my review until I had the opportunity to go back and see it a second time. Now that I've been able to do that, I feel like I have a firm grasp on the film and a fair understanding of what I liked and what I didn't like about it. The first thing I'd like to discuss is Michael Giacchino's soundtrack. Rogue One opens with the classic A Long Time Ago in a Galaxy Far Far Away text that we've known for nearly 40 years. Then it abruptly changes to a star field without an opening crawl as the camera pans up to a planet. The music during this first scene sounds very much like Star Wars music. We watch the first scene, which then cuts to the Rogue One title. The title is accompanied by music that sounds similar to Star Wars, but not completely. I felt that it sounded like a knockoff of Star Wars more than anything else, and I thought it would have been better for them to have just used the actual classic theme for that one instance. Even if they had to rearrange it and add some new parts to change it up, I think it would have been more effective. Throughout the film, there are a few callbacks to John Williams' compositions, such as those for the Imperial March and the Force theme. But mostly, the music is new, and we hear that same musical cue that opened the film with the Rogue One title from time to time. At the end, the film cuts to the usual music we always hear at the end of each Star Wars film. I thought this was interesting since they seemed to be afraid of using the Star Wars theme at the opening of the film. It gave me the impression that they were kind of indecisive and didn't really know what to do with this spin-off as far as incorporating some of those classic elements went. In my opinion, either stick to the formula completely or do something entirely different. In any case, I felt that the soundtrack worked. There weren't any truly memorable pieces as we've heard in the saga films. There isn't an Imperial March, nor a throne room theme but I felt that the music was effective and got me through the movie. Secondly, there's the story and its characters. We all knew what Rogue One was going to be about and how it would ultimately end. We knew the Rebels would win their first major victory against the Empire and steal the Death Star plans. But the movie exists so that we can see this play out and learn who was involved. And to make money. Lots of money. To some extent, the story requires that you already be familiar with Star Wars mythology. Early on, things like the Fours, the Jedi, and lightsabers are briefly mentioned, but not elaborated on. The film seems to assume that you already have at least seen the prequels and have a decent grasp on what these terms mean. I'm not going to rehash the whole movie here because, again, I'm assuming you've already seen it and know what happens, but I do want to touch on the key points and the characters. In short, the movie follows Jyn Erso, played by Felicity Jones, on her voyage from a seemingly rebellious loner to someone who ends up tangled in the rebellion's web of war against the Empire. When we first meet Jyn, she is a child whose imperial defected father, Galen Erso, portrayed by Mads Mikkelsen, is living in hiding with his wife, Lyra, and their young daughter. We are quickly introduced to director Orson Krennic, played by Ben Mendelsohn, who finds Galen and Lyra and has Lyra killed in front of Galen. Krennic doesn't escape unscathed and takes a shot to the shoulder. Keep this in mind because it does foreshadow something later in the film. The planet this scene takes place on is visually striking with its black sand and dimly lit atmosphere. It creates a different kind of visual that has not previously been seen in a Star Wars film. Sagarera, portrayed by Forrest Whitaker, rescues Jin and raises her as his own. We do not get to see what their relationship is like until the two are reunited at a later time. Frankly, Saw seems to have lost it a little bit and serves little true purpose in the film beyond serving as Jin's old caretaker. Galen sends Bodhi Rook, played by Riz Ahmed, to deliver a secret message to Jin. Bodhi agrees to defect and delivers the message to Saw on the planet of Jeddah. Of course, nothing is as simple as it seems, and Bodhi is tortured by Saw and his men, something which makes little sense since all they really had to do was watch the message he was delivering to remove any suspicion they may have had about him. During this time, we see how Jin becomes mixed up in the Galactic Civil War. We also meet Captain Kazin Andor pretty early on, who is a brutal intelligence officer and at least a part-time hitman for the Rebellion. Seeing the darker side of the Rebellion was unexpected, but something that was very welcome, as it painted an alternate take on what it means to be the good guys in what is essentially a series of war films. 
There are also other characters who come into play, such as Cassian's reprogrammed Imperial droid, K2SO, played by Alan Tudyk, and longtime friends Chirut Mwe, played by Donnie Yen, and Baze Melvis, played by Jiang Wen. Chirut is a blind warrior monk who is not Force-sensitive in the way the Jedi are, but is attuned to it in a way unlike the other characters. There are circumstances where he senses the dark side and knows how to shoot down TIE fighters, even though he's blind, and this is all seemingly due to his connection to the Force. Baze, on the other hand, is the pessimistic who no longer believes in the Force and chooses to rely on his rapid-firing blaster machine gun. And it's a pretty awesome gun. Factor all of these performances in with Grand Moff Tarkin, who is introduced early on and occupies a sizable portion of screen time, Darth Vader, and the assortment of rebel leaders, and you have a film that is throwing all kinds of characters at you at once. This ultimately works to the detriment of the film, as it does not allow any of them to be completely fleshed out. At the same time, it is intriguing to see all the people involved on both sides who play a part in how the story unfolds. Tarkin was, at least to me, a surprising aspect of the film. I figured he'd show up thanks to publicity stills from the film, but I didn't expect that he would be a combination of an actor and CG to recreate the great Peter Cushing's iconic performance. In my view, the CG worked very well. I have heard others say it wasn't convincing. I have also spoken to some people who were not big Star Wars fans who thought it was a real actor. As such, I'd say that they did a very good job, and I also suspect that Star Wars fans might see it as being more fake than other people uh, because of our knowledge of the character and because we know that the actor died over 20 years ago. Additionally, Tarkin's movements, mannerisms, and speech were purely classic Tarkin, and that was one of the highlights of the film for me. Of course, we all knew from the trailers that Darth Vader would be making an appearance. His first is what I've been referring to as naked Darth Vader taking a back to bath. Granted, we don't see much of Vader's body in his back to tank, which is probably for the best, quite honestly. Initially, I didn't know how I felt about seeing Vader in this vulnerable state and feared it might take away from the mystery of the character. And perhaps to some degree it does, but I also feel that it adds a bit more dimension to him and lets the audience see another side of him. Having a castle on Mustafar, of all places, was also interesting to me as it doesn't make much logical sense given what happened to him nearly two decades prior on that planet. The second Darth Vader scene is perhaps the biggest, most discussed scene of the film, and that's Lord Vader taking action against a group of rebel troopers in his quest to retrieve the stolen Death Star plans. This is Vader in a way we've never seen him before in live action, and it is very welcome given how plain awesome the scene is. In Rogue One, Vader is brutal, forceful, imposing, and quite scary. For the first time in my life, perhaps, I actually felt scared of Vader. I also found it quite cool how they faithfully recreated his imperfect costume as first seen in A New Hope. James Earl Jones also did a great job with Vader's dialogue, and it was great to hear him speak a few lines. The sound and processing of his voice was quite similar to A New Hope as well. The one downside to having Vader and Tarkin in this film is that they really step on director Krennic's toes. I felt that Ben Mendelsohn, who I have long admired as an actor, did a good job with the part. However, he never really got to shine since he was overshadowed by the other villains. We see him frequently in the film, yet he comes across as half-baked. The second half of the film deals with Jin's brief reunion with Galen before he dies from an Alliance attack her new role as a leader who is determined to help the Alliance steal the Death Star plans, and the mission that brings that goal to fruition. The third act takes place primarily on the gorgeous, Caribbean-like planet of Scarif. Jin and her new team disobey the Rebel Council's decision not to take action against the Empire and steal the Imperial vessel they had already stolen from the Imperial outpost on Edu. On Scarif, each team member is given a role to fill during the heist, with Jin, Cassian, and K2 disguising themselves as Imperials and infiltrating the base. Lots of delightful eye candy takes place during this time, including AT, ACTs in action, rebels fighting on the ground against stormtroopers, and atmospheric and space battles between the Rebellion and the Empire. It is also during this time that all of our rebels are killed one after the other. Perhaps the saddest death comes from Chirrut, who was proved to be one of the most likable and charismatic characters in the film. Baze's death soon follows after he manages to take out nearly all of Krennic's death troopers, and Bodhi, Kazi, and Engine all eventually die after transmitting the Death Star plans to the Rebel fleet above. This was an unexpected turn of events, especially for a Star Wars film. Even though I didn't feel too much for the characters when they died, except for Chirrut and Baze, of course, I honestly thought that Jin and Kazian would at least make it out unscathed. Krennic loses his life too, 
After being shot by Kazian, as he makes his move to kill Jin, Krennic sees the Death Star in the sky arriving to take out the Imperial base on Scarif. Just as he had taken a gunshot early in the movie in an attempt to control Galen, he takes a second gunshot after attempting to control the power of the Death Star. It costs him dearly and serves as a bit of irony that his beloved project is ultimately responsible for his own death. The film ends on a high note following Vader's attack on the Rebels, as the Rebel blockade runner from the first film manages to escape with the plans. We see Captain Antilles hand the plans to Princess Leia, who miraculously looks exactly like herself in A New Hope. She replies that they now have hope. As with Tarkin, Leia was a mix of a real actor along with CG, used to recreate Carrie Fisher's young princess. I felt that the effect was extremely convincing and packed the emotional punch that the film needed to end on. Honestly, seeing Leia like this made me emotional. In that moment, everything that leads up to this is worth the journey, and the stage is set for what happens immediately afterward in the opening scenes of A New Hope. Overall, Rogue One is a solid effort that does a good job of showcasing the great heist that would ultimately lead to the destruction of the Death Star. My biggest issues with the film have to do with character development, unnecessary story elements, and some minor confusion over the final moments of the film. As previously noted, there are numerous characters in this film, and as a result, none of them get fully fleshed out. As a spin-off film, this makes sense to a degree, but I would have loved to have learned a little bit more about our heroes. Certain parts of the movie simply did not make sense to me. The tentacle monster that Saw uses in torturing Bodhi seemed unnecessary, as did Saw as a character, quite honestly. I do love that they brought a Clone Wars character into live action, but I felt that it was ultimately a wasted opportunity since Saw does little more than act a little wacky and brutalize a pilot trying to save the galaxy. His connection to Jin seems to be the main reason he exists, but I felt that he could have been handled a bit better. As much as I love seeing Tarkin, I felt that he was used a bit gratuitously. He's an important player in the story, so seeing him does make sense. I just think they could have dialed it back a little bit, especially considering the technological circumstances which enabled him to actually appear in the film. At the end, Vader sees the Tana 4 escape with the Death Star plans. He knows they're on board. This works for Rogue One, but it doesn't work as well for A New Hope, since Vader says the plans were beamed to the ship despite his knowledge that they are on a physical medium of some sort. And technically, I suppose they were beamed to the Rebel fleet rather than just the Rebel command ship, so they could have been intercepted that way, but it's the fact that Vader actually saw the plans being handed around that makes this A New Hope dialogue a bit odd. Additionally, Vader knows the plans are on board, yet Leia and the crew seem to be totally oblivious to having just been in the middle of a major space battle. Their denial is likely just their way of trying to talk their way out of it, as Leia does claim diplomatic immunity. But it's hard to reconcile the fact that she tells Vader they are on a diplomatic mission when he actually saw them leaving the battle scene with the plans. Perhaps Leia and the crew are just unaware that Vader saw them escaping. This isn't a deal breaker for me, but it is a notable continuity issue that only makes sense from a certain point of view. I hope it is addressed eventually so that we understand the filmmakers' intent. Also, this is a minor gripe, but where were all the 1970s hairstyles? This was a good opportunity to blend in the aesthetic of Rogue One with A New Hope, but seemingly one that was either overlooked or neglected. I mentioned how much I liked Chirrut and Baze. They were my favorite characters in the film. I found them to be intriguing and likable, and again, I felt for them when they died. I also really enjoyed the new planets and locales we got to experience for the first time. The boots on the ground action on Jeddah and Scarif were well executed, and I greatly enjoyed the space battle, which seemed like something straight out of A New Hope. I loved the character cameos immensely. Bail Organa was one of my favorite characters in the prequels, so it was great seeing Jimmy Smith's breathe life back into the character. My only regret is that we didn't get a scene of him with Leia, though I know that it would have ruined her appearance at the end of the film. It was great to see Mon Mothma in a larger capacity. Dr. Evazon and Ponta Baba from the Mos Eisley Cantina were also quite fun to see. There was also Blue Milk. We had C-3PO and R2-D2 for a moment. We glimpsed Chopper and the Ghost from Star Wars Rebels. We finally got to see a kyber crystal in live action. And we learned why Luke will be the new Red 5 in A New Hope. Also, one of my favorite things was seeing Red Leader and Gold Leader, as alternate takes and unused footage were used to integrate them into Rogue One. The tie-ins to A New Hope are certainly there, even if they are not all completely fleshed out. Overall, I feel that Rogue One is a solid film that fans of the classic trilogy are sure to enjoy. It's also hard not to compare it to other Star Wars films, especially last year's The Force Awakens. 
While I feel The Force Awakens was a better film, I still appreciate Rogue One for its connections to A New Hope and feel that director Gareth Edwards did a highly admirable job of making it feel like a Star Wars movie. And at the end of the day, perhaps that's the most important thing. Alright my friends, I hope that you've enjoyed this film review of Rogue One A Star Wars Story. Let me know your own thoughts and feelings down in the comments. Be sure to follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And as always, I would like to thank you for tuning in to Victoria's Cantina. Until next time, my friends, may the force be with you.